Hello, I'm Chris Conroy. This rather imposing looking structure here is a timber jig for the construction of a foam sandwich yacht and as such it represents the epitome of the dreams of a man of imagination. The man who built this and subsequently built a yacht from it probably in an office or a factory and decided over a period of months or years that what he'd really like to do is to sail around the world. He could himself sliding into a moonlit port in the Greek islands, sailing across the Caribbean, visiting all of the islands there, and generally enjoying the world in the way in which man was meant to enjoy it. Now if he'd have, have dreamt those dreams 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, the only way he would have been able to, to build a boat would have been to acquire a large number of skills which required a lot of time to acquire. He would have had to have become uh, extremely competent at carpentry, he would have had to have gained an understanding of the structures of the way in which boats are built, he would have had to have become his own engineer so he could install his own boat. That is of course if he decided that he wanted to build it himself. Now some men did do that in the years before foam came along, but about 15 years ago rigid PVC foam became readily available on the world market. It, it comes under several brands, but the, the simple advent of that material put the building of this type of boat within the reach of virtually anybody. You don't have to acquire a large number of skills. Uh, all of the techniques that are applied to building a boat from this jig are readily available, readily learnt. They don't require any particular special hand-eye coordination. You don't have to be a, an industrial chemist. You don't have to be an engineer or a structural designer. You can simply go out and with a minimal amount of information, with a lot of enthusiasm and energy, because as you can see it's quite a large jig and the boat that came off it was equally large, and you can build yourself a boat and you can sail off around the world. Now, some people don't do that. They get halfway through building the boat uh, for various reasons. They get tired of it or their personal circumstances change and somebody else follows up and finishes the boat off. I happen to know, however, that the boat that came off this jig is currently somewhere in the Greek islands. So the man who built this boat really did realise his dream. Now, the techniques and materials are applicable to a huge range of sizes and types of boats. You don't have to build a yacht of this size, you can build a little sailing dinghy. You don't even have to build a sailing boat, you can build a power boat. And the materials are equally adaptable and equally suitable for all of those different applications. Now, what we're going to do in the tape that, you, that, that we're going to get into now is show you all of the techniques that apply not only to building the jig but also to building the boat from it. We're going to show you absolutely everything, all of the little tricks and all of the little wrinkles that I learnt over 20 years of being involved in fibreglass and over many years of teaching exactly these techniques in a, an amateur boat builder centre in Sydney. And believe me, there are a lot of wrinkles involved, there are a lot of things that you can learn when you do understand the materials that make the building of the jig and of the boat infinitely easier, much, much faster and more importantly of course quite a lot cheaper because it, it can eliminate the problems that you may have of doing something, messing it up and having to come back and do it again. So the, the tape is the first of a, of a series of tapes designed to do this for people who want to use fiberglass and uh, uh, exotic composites, all kinds of, uh, of fiberglass related materials in all applications which we'll be producing over the next year or so. So come into my workshop now and we'll get busy, we'll build ourselves a jig and then we'll build the boat. Most people who embark upon a project like this without having had any previous experience and without having built anything in the past generally feel that it's going to be the only thing they'll build, they'll sail off around the world and probably never need a work workshop or the power tools again. And they tend to skimp on workshop equipment. Now it's been my experience over the years that that really doesn't work because what happens is they establish skills, their plans generally change and they don't sail off around the world. They learn things and establish skills which leads them into a way of life that, that causes them to get involved in the effectively I guess the do-it-yourself movement. And they find that they have an, an ongoing need for the power tools. Now even if they do sail off around the world Quite often, if the boat is big enough to do that, she has a workshop and the power tools with which you've built the boat could also be set up in the workshop aboard the boat 
and be of ongoing use. So I've always been a firm believer in not skimping on your workshop equipment. Buy the best brand of power tools, buy as many as you need to do the job, and you'll find that they'll stand you in excellent stead for the rest of your life. Now I'll just give you a quick rundown on the way in which I've set up my workshop. Now after many years of, uh, of owning a workshop and of owning factories, fiberglass factories, I've tried just about every brand of power tool in the business and I've settled on Ryobi to equip my current workshop. Now I don't just use it for building boats, I also build aeroplanes in it, so I have to have the best possible power tools and it's also essential that the tools that I buy last for a long time. There's no point in buying something cheap that's going to fall apart halfway through the job and you've got to buy a second one. Now as far as a range of tools is concerned, almost the sky's the limit. Obviously here there's a small bandsaw with about a 12 inch throat there. Behind it, and I'll show you more about this a little later, is a planar thickness, which is a superb piece of equipment and very handy. As far as hand tools are concerned, a jigsaw is absolutely essential. This is a cordless electric drill, and nowadays cordless will do everything that a, that a uh, normal 240 drill will do, a mains power drill will do, so I've, I've stayed with that. And this is also an extremely useful piece of equipment. It's a power screwdriver, and it does a, a, a superb job, again, as you'll see as we go through the exercise. Now, there are other tools that I'll show you. We have circular saws and we have various sanding uh, hand tools uh, over there, which I'll show you as we go through the overall exercise. But I just wanted to emphasise the point that the, the best way to go about the job is to do every single step thoroughly, and those steps include the most important of all, and that is setting your workshop up properly with the proper equipment. Now I've designed a little boat for this exercise. It's an eight foot round bilge dinghy. The only reason I chose that shape and size was because from the point of view of foam sandwich boat building, a small round bilge boat is the most difficult of all shapes and sizes over which to fit the foam. Come and I'll show you the design. There's nothing particularly special about the kitten. Uh, this is a, a one quarter scale drawing, very, fairly typical of my workshop working drawings. There's nothing there that doesn't have to be there in order for me to be able to build the boat. I've lofted the sections onto here from the side view and the plan view. She's got a fairly bluff bow which is unusual for a little displacement boat, but I've found from experience that that bluff bow certainly keeps the boat a lot drier. Now, I'm not going through the, the uh, lofting process because most people who uh, build a boat uh, in their backyard, a foam sandwich boat, buy the plans, and those plans in nine, 99 cases out of 100 include fully lofted sections. In other words, the sections that you need here in order to make the jig. So uh, we won't spend too much time on that. It's really not necessary. We'll get on with the job of building the jig. Now I've done a fairly quick job of lofting my full-size patterns onto, onto paper from the quarter scale drawing. And you can see these lines across the pattern there. All I did was measure up from the bottom from my reference line and then I, I used dividers to get four times the, the distance off the quarter scale plan right out along those lines and then simply uh, join them up with a, uh, a ship's curve or a French curve. Now that gave me exactly the shape I need for the basic pattern. Again you'll find that with the plans that you buy these patterns will be supplied. You'll probably have to do something like cut around them. The method that I'm going to show you for transferring the patterns onto the actual jig material is a very simple one. Now, when you get up into larger boats, and one of the problems we strike in having to scale all this down in order to fit it into uh, an area that the camera can actually see in one shot, is that the method of making these formers varies. You'll find that in the large jigs, as we saw a little earlier, they're made up of various strips and pieces of material that are fitted together to form, if you like, a, a curve with angles, and then that curve is actually smoothed off to the actual contour. But again, the method I'm going to show you is, will be usable even using that method. Now, it's quite simple. All I do is take some, some ordinary sticky tape, and you can use any kind of adhesive tape. Just find the end of it there, which is not easy sometimes. Stick. I've, I've drawn a vertical line on the board there. Now that's my reference point. I line up the vertical centre line of the pattern piece with that, keeping it level with the bottom. I then simply put a couple of pieces of this sticky tape, and the end has disappeared again, onto that vertical centre line. 
and then using a, a readily available spray pack can of flat black paint, I simply spray from a reasonable distance right around the edge. Now that gives me a perfect imprint of the pattern on the paper without having to, to worry about trying to trace around paper, which is very difficult to trace around anyhow, or without using any of the other fairly lengthy and difficult methods. Now that gives me, as you can see, quite an accurate cutting line. All I do is pivot it over using the, the sticky tape as a hinge and simply blow the paint on to the other side. Now as you can see, I've, I've put several pieces of paper together to form this pattern, but nevertheless the pattern is quite accurate and it's lofted accurately from the basic drawing. Now I'll tell you what these uh, rectangular holes are for in just a minute. Now having done that, you simply lift the paper off and you're ready to cut it. Now whatever you do before you actually cut it out, make sure you mark the number. Now in this case it's number seven. So it's a rough seven but at least it shows me exactly the number that I'm using. Now I'll just move these tools off here. One of the, the reasons that I mentioned power tools earlier is because I guess you could say there are horses for courses and a, a good jigsaw is so much better than a mediocre or bad jigsaw that it's not funny. This particular one has a wide range of functions and I'll just show you some of them. Firstly, I'll just run it and see if you can hear me over the top. Firstly, it is a variable speed jigsaw. You, it has an electronic variable speed. Not only that, but you can adjust the degree to which the blade moves backwards and forwards. Now that's extremely handy, particularly when you're cutting thick, hard material. Now this chipboard is very, very easy to cut. It cuts easily. So you don't need so much of that blade uh, orbital action, if you like. Secondly, it has electronically variable speed. And I'll just show you how that works. Now I don't know if you could detect the difference in the note there, but that little knob on the top there, which you can control with your thumb while you're using the, the saw, varies the speed at which the saw runs, and that is a great asset as well. Now without further ado, we'll, we'll use the jigsaw to cut this particular bulkhead out. Before I go any further, you must always be mindful of the location of your sawhorses. You don't want to cut through the sawhorse because the whole thing then falls to the ground. You must also make sure that as you cut the sections off, they're not going to fall on your foot and that they're not going to damage the rest of the, the bulkhead when they fall off because this stuff is fairly heavy and it's very, very soft so it chips easily. And I'll show you a bulkhead a little later which suffered from exactly that problem. Now I'll just finish cutting this half of it. It's a good idea once you get halfway around to to clip off that extra section. Now fortunately it just broke off for me so there were no problems. You'll notice that I made this single piece of, uh, of timber up out of two pieces by simply joining them together with a gusset plate behind and that's an excellent way of maximising the utilisation of your material. Now I'll just spin her around and we'll go through the rest of it. By the way, when you're using a, a jigsaw such as this, never insert the blade with the saw running. Always put the blade in the slot before you actually switch the saw on. Okay, that takes care 
of that particular bulkhead. I'll just move the, the saw uh, horses in a little closer. Now you'll notice that I have some notches marked in the, the patterns there and they've been marked out by the flat black lacquer as I sprayed it on. I'll cut those out. They require a fair bit more care than the basic shape. Now you'll notice that I've cut those vertical slots there and I've half in a curve cut the bottom of them out. One of the great advantages of these machines is, as you've seen, their ability to go around quite a tight corner. Now I'll just turn this around so I can get a better angle. And complete cutting the notches out. Now you can see that they're quite accurate to the basic pattern. Do the other side. You'll notice that I, I just use my thumb to steady the foot of the saw there. If you're careful, it's not hazardous, but you must be very careful, obviously, in getting your fingers close to that blade because it'll rip a finger off in very, very short time. So be very careful, but it often helps to have a thumb there to steady the, the foot. Okay, now that's the, the basic method of marking out and cutting out the various formers or stations right around the boat. Now I've got a little more cutting to do. I've got some more notches to cut in all of the other bulkheads which I've already cut out. I'll do that and we'll come back and look at the next step. Okay, that, that cuts all of those out. Now, it's obvious that that jigsaw, because it's hand controlled, is not capable of cutting a perfectly smooth curve. It would really have to be mounted on some kind of a, of a machine in order to do that. The shape of these bulkheads has been drawn, I've drawn it up with a little bit extra over, around about an eighth of an inch over, so that I can fare them up later when I've assembled them all. Now the next step after having done that is the assembly. And it's, it's here that we have to get really accurate. The fact that those curves are in the, the, uh, the formers doesn't really matter, but it does matter from here on that we cut each of these accurately. Now, I mentioned those little dark rectangles on the formers before. They accommodate the wooden beams which form the strong back on which they sit. Now, if you can see closely there, you'll notice that the distance between the shear line and that beam is a lot greater there than it is down here. They've been marked on the, the patterns and on the formers to accommodate that difference in the shear line. So it's most important that each of them be marked with that distance there absolutely accurately, particularly from the actual keel, and also the width in between and the size of the rectangles have to be done accurately. Now, I don't really trust the spray can method of marking out to give me that accurate, that, that exactly accurate measurement. So what I've done is stuck the patterns back on to the formers and I'm going to use a rule to make sure that they're marked out absolutely accurately. Now we're working in imperial measurements, partly because I'm more comfortable doing it that way and secondly because this tape is going to go to countries which use imperial. I'm sure that most people will be able to buy, either buy an imperial rule or be able to convert from imperial to metric. Now what I do is lay that across there and mark a pencil line along the jig. Now the, the steel rule holds the paper down so that that mark will be accurate. I then mark down this inside edge as well and leave it at that. Now I know from measurement that my centre line is 9 and 3 sixteenths of an inch from the inside of that aperture there. So I'll just roll this over. I have the centre line marked on the timber 
Again, I have exactly 9 and 3 sixteenths, so I'm satisfied with that. I'm satisfied that my centre line is vertical and that the paper pattern is vertical to that. So I mark another pencil line, and again, I mark another vertical line. Now, those lines, those pencil lines, actually harden up the fuzzy appearance that the spray can gave me. Obviously, it's not possible to get the paper down hard against the timber, and the spray will go underneath and give you a fuzzy appearance. In these areas here, the pencil lines have actually hardened that up and given you an accurate cutting line. Now, the other thing I have to do is extend this down. Now, I'll do it more accurately with a square. I have to extend these lines down to the actual bottom of the former. Now, I'm going to do this to all of them now, and we'll be back in a minute with the next step. Now, while I've been doing this, a couple of points have occurred to me. Firstly, if you were going to build a large jig that was too large to keep indoors, you obviously wouldn't use chipboard. You'd use straight timber, because chipboard, once it gets wet, grows to about half again its normal thickness and is totally useless. In most cases, people build these large boats up to 40, 45 feet outside or under a lean-to. This really isn't suitable. That also applies if you intend to reuse the jig over and over and over. You would go to straight timber rather than chipboard. The reason that I'm using it is because it's convenient and easy and relatively cheap. The other aspect of it is, while I was marking out the slots to cut for the strong back, a very interesting thing happened. I measured using my rule off the drawing there, and when I translated it onto the, the former, I found that in some cases it, it was way out according to the little black uh, rectangles that I blew on there with, the, with the, the spray pack. So what I did to check it is went back with a pair of dividers. A very simple tool, but by adjusting the dividers to the drawing and then simply walking out four divisions, I found that my measurement came much more accurately into line. So rather than multiplying a measurement, whether it be metric or imperial, off a ruler by four or by whatever factor the scale is on your plans, use dividers because they are the things that will give you the most accurate reading. Now, having done all that, I've cut out all of the, uh, the bulkheads except one. We'll cut this one out just to show you the way the, uh, the, 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 way the slots are cut and then we're ready to put it together. By the way, this is excellent uh, exercise for your lungs because you find that you're constantly puffing the, uh, the sawdust away from the line that you're cutting along. Now, when I'm cutting up these vertical lines here, these have to slot down over the inch and three quarter by three and three quarter Oregon strongback that I'm going to use, I cut actually through the line. I cut the line itself off to give me that little bit of clearance so that they'll slide down over the top of the timber. I still suspect, by the way, that some of them are going to be a bit tight. As far as the top line is concerned, this is the one that has to be accurately fitted as far as the overall depth is concerned. I'm leaving the, the edge of the line on the, the, uh, the former. Now, it's probably a little difficult for, you, difficult for you to see that, but that's what I'm doing. Okay, now I've gotten all of the, uh, the formers and all of their slots for the strong back cut as accurately as I possibly can. The next step is to cut the, the Oregon for the strong back to length and come back and set it up and we'll apply, we'll install these on it back in a minute. Now I've chosen the straightest timber I can find 
for the strong back. It's Oregon, and it really is true and straight. Now, off the drawing, I've measured my 20 inches of the major section of the strong back, which of course translates to 80 inches. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be absolutely accurate, so you don't have to go to the trouble of using the, uh, the dividers for that. In fact, it's a bit difficult to get dividers that'll run 20 inches. Put a line across there, put a square line down it, and the next step is the most important one, put your protective goggles on. Now, I should have been wearing these when I used the jigsaw, but the jigsaw is relatively gentle as far as throwing pieces of, uh, uh, of sawdust around, whereas this, this one, particular saw, the uh, circular saw, is not, and it'll throw uh, sawdust into your eyes very, very smartly. The other aspect of it is you have to lean over and actually watch the blade contact area uh, in order to be able to cut accurately, and that of course means that it really will throw sawdust in your eye. Now, when I cut this off, that end is going to fall down. That's fine. What you have to do when you're using a, a radial saw, a, a circular saw I mean, is keep a bit of upward pressure on the timber so that the timber will actually break upwards in that way. Otherwise, if you have downward pressure on it, it will jam the saw blade with sometimes dire results. You must treat this machinery, and of course all the cutting tools, with great respect, but particularly the circular saw. So we'll just cut through here. Now you'll notice that that timber broke upwards, which is the ideal situation. I had it overbalanced over the sawhorse and I was also holding it up. As I said before, the last thing you want it to do, want to do is have downward pressure on the timber. As it cuts through, it jams the blade with sometimes dire results. Now these things really give you a funny view of the world through those yellow glasses, so I'll take them off. Now we've cut both of our 80 inch lengths of strong back. This one has a knot hole on the edge, so I'll set, set it up with that down. We'll just move the, the circular saw over onto the, the bench there to get it out of the way. Move these, and we're ready to set up one of our stations. Now by measurement, my stations on the drawing are four inches apart, which of course translates to 16 inches on the strong back. So we simply come down and mark increments of 16 inches. There's 16. 32, 48, 64, and 80 inches. Now, just to avoid confusion, we're working from the transom, which is going to be this end, forward. I know that I've got seven stations, so we'll go seven, six, five, four, three, two. Now, just pick up the tri-square and mark all of those measurements across onto the other side of the strong back so that they're true and square. It's a very easy way of translating them across, of course. Just line them up and run the pencil across. Do it the other way around for this one. And what I have to do now is in install the two stations, um, uh, ones that are fairly, a fair distance apart, say number six and number four, so that I can line those up parallel and exactly the right distance apart. Grab station number four and sit it over the strong back. Now it slots down over there, it's a little tight here and there but it's going to fit. Line it up on the marks and I'll grab station number six and do the same thing. Now you'll notice that I'm not too worried at this stage about true and square. That comes a little later. Now six again is a little tight, but it's slid down quite happily there over the top of the, uh, of the strong back. I'll just pull that back a little and line it up by eye at this stage. Now, you can see at this stage that it's starting to take the shape of a boat. And that's one of the great pleasures about doing this sort of thing, is the fact that the whole thing grows under your hands and before your eyes. And that's the sort of, that's the experience that captivates people who do this sort of work. Now the next step is to fix those into position. Now what I'm going to do is run some battens across there. I'm going to screw them there down onto the, the strong back and I'm also going to screw the stations 
to the battens. Now, that, as you can see, is a little long, so I'll just mark it with my thumb, nip it off with the jigsaw, which will only take a second. And this is where the great pleasure of having all these power tools really comes into play. Now, that lays across there, as you can see. It's around about the right length. I'll just pick up a screw here and show you how this power screwdriver works. Up until now, the only way of driving a screw was to drill a hole and laboriously drive the screw home with a screwdriver. Now that developed extremely strong wrists, but it was time consuming and a little frustrating. Nowadays you don't have to do any of that. All you do is buy a power screwdriver, as you see here, that is typified by this Ryobi one. It has a magnetic tip, the screw has a Phillips head, the screw has been specially designed for use with this tool and for soft timber. Now, I'm, I'll move that back, but I won't take it off the strong back because I'm using that station there to space the two members of the strong back. But I will line my timber up on the marks that I've already put on the strong back there. Simply put that in, apply the screw, and it's driven home. It's as quick and easy as that. You can adjust this nozzle in and out to govern the degree of countersink that you get with the screw. You can see that that's around about an eighth of an inch or three millimetres below the surface. Now, the, the amount of, of in or out movement that you adjust on that nozzle governs the amount of countersink, and the driver automatically stops driving the screw once the, the, the tip of the nozzle hits the surface of the timber. Absolutely superb. Now, I'll just grab another screw. And with station six still on the, the strong back and still relatively free in movement, all I have to do is line the other end of my piece of timber, my cross piece up, and do the same thing. Now that's fixed together and very, very, very strongly. Now I do the same thing up the front. The piece I cut off that should be about the right length for there, and it is. So I'll just grab a couple more screws and we will move station four forward, and it's a little tighter on the, on the strong back than station six was. Apply the screw to this particular one. The timber is right on the mark again. Simply put the screw in, spin it up, do the same on this end, and with the stations keeping the two uh, pieces of the strong back parallel, we now have them fixed in that position. Now the next step, and I'll just put the, the power driver on the floor there, the next step is to move this back against the cross piece, move this one back against the cross piece, and square the strong back up across ways. Now that's very simply done, simply by using an engineer's tri-square, and remarkably that's almost exactly square. Now the next step is to brace it so that it can't come out of square. That's done very, very simply by laying a piece of our scrap batten across there, drawing a line along it so that I cut it at a reasonable sort of an angle, remembering that this end of it has to avoid the, the uh, last station, so I'll just cut it off there. Again, the jigsaw comes into play to just nip that off across there. And across there. And the next step is simply to screw it on. Now I'll grab the power driver, a couple of screws, screw this end on. Now before I finally firm that up, I'll just have a second check to make sure that I haven't moved it out of square at all, and that it is just a tiny bit out. So. We'll joggle it back into square, check it again. It is perfectly square now. Put the second screw in. <coughs> check it once again, and it's perfectly square. Now, <coughs> we now know that both of our, the, our strong back members are parallel. We know that the, all of these members providing our marking from there to there for station number five and so on forward is accurate. 
that each of the, the stations will be square to the strong back. The only thing we don't know yet is whether the strong back is actually twisted. In other words, it's in wine. Now, we'll ignore that for the time being because that's something that we can, uh, we can fix up when we actually put the legs onto the strong back. So the, the next step is to install all of the other stations back as soon as we've done it. Okay, now, I've installed all of the stations up to station number three. I've driven screws into them, through the, the stations into the battens, all the way up to, to firm them up. Now you can see that they're still a little floppy, we'll take care of that in a minute. And using the marking out and the fixing techniques uh, that I've already shown you, I've made up a couple of brackets out of particle board to hold station number seven, which is the transom, at its proper 13 degree angle to a line drawn across along the bottom of the boat, and we'll talk about that a little later too. So that gives me the angle I need for the outboard to go on the back of the boat. Now, once again, I get back to the point that the jig that we're building here is for a very small boat. She's only a total of eight feet long. She's around about three foot six in the beam, so she's a little tiny displacement boat. The reason that, we're, that I've chosen this shape is because, as I said earlier, it's the most difficult to which to apply the foam. And as we progress here, you can certainly see that it's going to be difficult to get the foam over those contours. And that really is the basis of doing all this, is to show you the, the foam sandwich boat building techniques. But it occurred to me that a lot of people will want to apply those techniques to building small boats rather than the, the large yachts that we normally see built out of foam sandwich. And whilst the foam sandwich techniques and also 99% of the techniques we've applied to this little jig also apply to boats up to 60 or 70 or 80 feet long, some of them are specific to this size of small boat. So please forgive us because we're looking after everybody's interest in this tape. Now I'll just pick this up, spin it around. It's not light, but it's still light enough to do this with. Put it back on the sawhorses and we're ready to fit the last station to the bow. Now a couple of hours have elapsed and I've been working extremely hard. I'm almost exhausted as a matter of fact. The last station you saw fitted to the jig was that one there. In the meantime, I've set up this entire bow section. Now we already had these cut. I've fitted them to the, to the jig and I'll show you that in more detail in a minute. And I've made this section, which is effectively the, the cut water and the stem area of the boat. Now I used exactly the same techniques as I originally used to produce the shapes for these major stations. I plotted that using the dividers off the plan and fitted it up and fitted it to the jig. Now the techniques I used were the same as for all of the other stations, so there wasn't much point in repeating it and showing it to you again. Now, before we go any further, just a couple of philosophical thoughts, if you like. What we are endeavouring to achieve here is to hold the foam in the shape of a boat long enough to put the fibreglass skin on the outside of it. Now, that's all we're trying to achieve. The application of enormous amounts of time and craftsmanship, if you like, to the jig are essentially a waste of time because if you can achieve a jig which is true and square uh, and is not distorted in any way, if it's strong enough to take the loads of putting the foam on and then of laying the glass on and sanding and smoothing it off, etc., it is adequate for the job. Now, a lot of people get impatient with building jigs. They want to get to actually building the boat. So the methods that I'm, I've shown you so far and which I'll continue to show you are designed to achieve that end of a viable, usable jig for one or two or three, it may be three boats, in the shortest and quickest pop, uh, possible time. And once again, I get back to the fact that this is a relatively small boat and the techniques aren't necessarily identical to those that you'd use for a large yacht. Now, we're at the stage where I've, we've got all of those stations on, but we haven't done something which I referred to earlier, and that is actually true the jig up. We've made sure that the, the bulkheads, the stations, are square across the jig. In other words, that, it's, that it's, it's not a parallelogram, it's an exact rectangle. The next thing we need to do is to, to be able to support it away from the sawhorses and to stop it from doing that. Now, as you can see, when I lift that there, and by the way, it's assumed quite a degree of weight now, it twists very, very easily. Now the next step is to install the legs 
and to stop it from twisting in that way, I'm going to do it and then I'll come back and describe how I did it. Right, now I've fitted those legs and I'm just having a little clean up. And it's something I should mention. I often see projects in boat yards and in uh, backyards uh, around the country, people building boats, and almost without exception, they're a mess. People leave old bits of timber and power tools and saws and things laying on the ground under and around the jig. Now, it's not possible to work efficiently and properly when you're working under those circumstances, so it's essential that you regularly and periodically clean uh, the work site up. Make sure that there, there are no offcuts of timber underfoot, particularly with nails sticking out of them. It's astonishing how high you can leap if you drive a nail through your foot by treading on it when it's in a piece of timber. Now, as you can see, I've made up four brackets, again out of chipboard, not necessarily the best material for it, plywood would be a little better, but nevertheless, this jig is going to spend its life inside, so chipboard is quite adequate for the job. The legs are quite solid, very stout, they're made out of the same material as the strong back, and I cut them and sanded them to exact length. They're all, they're all exactly the same length. Now, if the floor were perfectly level, you would expect the jig to be sitting level, but it's almost impossible to find a level floor. Now, the way in which we true it up is really quite simple. You could do it by measurement, but again, because the floor is not necessarily level, that's very difficult to do. You could also do it by putting, if you like, winding sticks on there. In other words, you put a piece of true timber across there, sticking out a fair way on either side, a similar piece down the front. You get back a fair distance, lean down, and sight along them and line them up. But none of that is necessary if you have a very simple piece of equipment, and that is a spirit level, along with a true and parallel piece of material to use to sit it on. Now, I'll sit one end of it on there, and I'll check it for level. Now what we have to do, obviously, is prop up this side of the jig so that, that the bubble in the spirit level is level. Now I've, I've already cut on the, the bandsaw some little wedges out of timber. They're quite simple and obviously they're wedge shaped. So what I do is get down on the floor, put that wedge underneath that leg. Now it's just a matter of watching the bubble and tapping that wedge in until the bubble, of course, is in the centre of the division. Now that's pretty well exactly level there. Now, I can rely with the weight of the jig on this remaining pretty well static while I go and do the other end, but obviously, at some stage, I'm going to have to come back and check it. So we'll take this down here and we'll clean the sawdust off that batten there. There's no point in having that there to uh, mess up the, uh, the level of the levelling bar. Put the bar. Put the bar on, level on top of it, make sure it's all set. And I find also that this side of the jig is low, so I'll have to wedge that up as I did the last one. Put the wedge underneath, tap it until the bubble comes into the centre. little more and we're set. Now obviously the, the other thing about levels is that the bar and the level should be at 90 degrees to the centre line because if you have it skewed or canted like that it's going to give you a false reading. These are astonishingly useful pieces of equipment and can be used all the way through the construction of the jig and of the boat to make sure that everything is absolutely true and square. Now, the next step is to stiffen this strong back up, constantly checking it with the level so that it can't twist and get out of chew again back as soon as we've done it. Okay, well, a couple of days and six hours of intensive work on kitten here have elapsed since our last session. And I've advanced uh, quite extensively in the construction of the boat and looking back over the film that we'd already shot, it occurred to me that it's very difficult to show an operation such as this concisely so that you get every single step in and get the thing finished in a reasonable time. We'll end up having a tape that lasts 10 hours, so I've given it a fair bit of thought and I've ad advanced, as I said, quite well on the boat. I'll show you that in a minute. 
and I can show you the steps that I've taken in order to get to this particular stage. Now what we're going to do to finish off the tape is to apply the battens to that side of the jig so that it's ready for the application of the foam. In other words, we're going to get the jig to its totally finished stage. Now, when we were last here, we looked at stiffening up the jig, at taking out the twist that was in the jig there uh, because of the way in which it was set up. Now, I've used a couple of different methods to do that, both, both of them based on effectively giving the jig what amounts to a, a Warren Girder truss structure so that it won't twist. Now, one of the things you really have to consider when you're building a jig such as this is the fact that somebody is going to have to get underneath there and be available to push a needle up and down through the foam. In other words, I push the needle down from the top and somebody underneath pushes it back up again around the batten through the foam. So it's, it's essential to leave enough space in there to be able to do that. Now, unfortunately, be, again, because of the, the tiny size of Kitten, it's difficult to achieve what we need structurally and still be able to get that degree of room. So I've done the best I can and I've done it keeping in mind the fact that this jig will remain essentially static until the overall job is finished. So having levelled it up uh, as we saw with the spirit level and with the level bar, providing I don't move it and providing I don't kick the wedges out from under the legs and I've made sure that didn't happen by putting a, a, a drop of glue on the wedges and, and making sure that they're actually stuck to the legs rather than the floor by the way. If it remains there, it's not going to be put out of true and square. So that's something to consider and a lot of jigs are built in exactly that way. They're fixed, in fact some of them are even built on posts which are driven down into the ground so they, they can't ever move. Now, I'll show you quickly what I've done as far as stiffening it up. Now, those side members are quite deep. They're around about four inches or 100 millimetres deep. So what I've done is fix diagonal battens in opposite directions using a nail and glue in each bay right along the jig. Now that gave it a tremendous degree of stiffness. On top of that, I've put diagonal members from the bottom of the leg to the centre of the jig on both sides. And on each end of the jig, I've done essentially what I did on the top there and put diagonal battens both ways from here down to the bottom of the legs. Now the jig isn't totally stiff. It's really difficult as I said, unless you go to a lot of trouble, a lot of unnecessary trouble for something this size, to get it perfectly stiff. But it certainly is a lot stiffer than it was before and it's certainly perfectly suitable for the job that we have to do. Now I fared up this side and I'll show you the techniques for doing that in just a minute. I fared this side up and I've applied all the battens and again I'll show you that in a minute too. The fairing process is fairly simple but we're at a stage now where every single thing you do must be oriented towards making the boat as fair and as true as possible. The last thing you want to have to do when you've, got, you've gotten your foam and your fiberglass on is have to go along it and fill and sand unnecessarily. It's an unpleasant job, it's very dusty, it makes you itchy and you breathe a lot of the dust even though you may have a dust filter on. So you want to minimise that fairing both in the interests of, as I said, making the job easier and of course uh, a, a, a more important aspect of it is the fact that it will make the boat look a lot better. The less fairing you have to do as you go through the job the better the boat's going to look. So everything we do from this stage on is oriented towards making that the top layer of fibreglass that we're going to put over the foam as fair as we can possibly get it. No hills and hollows, uh, no large bumps in it, absolutely perfect. So at this stage you commence a program of taking a lot of care over making sure that these battens are absolutely true and fair. Now. I, as I said, six hours have gone by and I've put quite a lot of work into it. What I did was I used again my spirit level. Once I'd gotten the strong back uh, horizontal, I then used the spirit level with the vertical end on it, which you can see there, the vertical bubble, to drop down the centre of the, uh, the stations there and finally establish my vertical centre lines. I marked those with a pencil down the vertical faces of each of the stations. I then used a string line underneath to make sure that they were in line. In other words, by stretching a string line right along the bottom down the dead centre from the centre of the, the transom there to the centre of the stem, I was able to locate the bottom 
of the spirit level, move it backwards and forwards at the top, and then mark the vertical centre line. Very simple. And then by getting back and using my eye to look down those centre lines, I found that they li lined up exactly, which was a nice confirmation of the fact that it was all true and square. And your eye is an extremely useful and, and even essential piece of equipment when you're building something like this. It's okay to measure it, to use string lines and rules and all the rest of it to measure it, but the final proof of the pudding is whether your eye tells you that it's true and it's square. And it's very easy by squinting one eye and looking along a, a baton or a centre line or something to see that, that the, the various marks line up and that the baton isn't curved or, uh, or, or out of true. So your eye really is an essential part of it and you'll find that you'll develop a very accurate and true eye fairly early in the building process. Now, we'll, we'll just change things around a little and I'll come around and show you how I use this baton to fare up the various parts of all the stations. Now the main tool we use here is a fairing baton. Now it's a bit difficult to buy these battens when the, that are nice and true and square so I've sorted through all of the, uh, the timber I have and I found one which may not necessarily be perfect but at least it's good enough for the job. Now I usually work by myself and I've I've found and worked out all kinds of methods for gaining extra hands. Obviously G clamps and spring clamps are enormously useful, but another really useful piece of equipment that, that I use uh, for clamping and holding things is the old bungee cord, or as the surfies call them, ochre straps. And of, of course they're rubber inside a braided nylon sheath there with a hook on each end, and it's amazing just how useful they can be. Now what I need to do here is hold this baton against the transom of the jig and be able to walk forward and test it against the other, the other members. So what I do is loop a couple of them together, pull them around and loop it around the end of that baton. Now it will hold it there quite firmly, providing of course there's a bit of baton sticking out the end. Now the purpose of the exercise is to curve that baton around so that it touches each of the formers pull it all the way around to there and you can see if I get out of the way the the formers that it's touching and the ones that it isn't touching now I can see quite clearly that it's touching the second one from the back and this one but it's missing the one between them by around about a quarter of an inch or about five or six millimeters so what I have to do obviously is take a small amount of off this one and a small amount off that one so that the batten will touch it. Now by doing that and working forward and using various stations on various parts of the jig, in fact you only really need to use three or four uh, positions on the jig and providing the curve is nice and, nice and even and there are no lumps in it, you'll find that it'll be fair all the way around. Now there's a, a wide variety of tools uh, for working wood in this particular way. You don't want to take too much off but you want to make sure that the job doesn't take too long. Now you can go low-tech traditional and use the old spoke shave and it's a marvellous piece of equipment to pull, pull down like that. Not so good on chipboard because the chipboard doesn't really cut as well as it should but providing the spoke shave is sharp and that one is, it'll do the job. If you want to go high-tech with tools and the spoke shave just fell on the floor you can go to a power planer, which really does remove material very quickly. In fact, so quickly that when you are close to fair, you have to be very careful about using it. Or you can go to a belt sander. Now, at this particular stage where the, the form has turned out pretty well fair, that's the piece of equipment that I prefer to use and it's just a question of pulling it over the former. Don't let it stay still at any time and just make sure that you progressively round that off. Now that'll do for that one. I don't want to do any more until I've had a look at it. So I'll do this one as well. One of the other things I'm doing here 
while I'm actually fairing them off is also putting a slight angle on the edge of those formers. Obviously I've cut them with the so it's a square cut. Now the jig is curved so I'm just introducing a little bit of angle mainly by eye, again the eye comes into play so that the battens will contact right across the width of the former. So I'll just finish this one off and show you the result. <laughs> Now another way you can find hills and hollows is just by gently running your hand over it. And it's surprising how sensitive your hand is and how accurately it will show you where there are hills and hollows. Okay, <clears throat> we'll have a look at that. I suspect that it will be fairly accurate. Okay, we just hook the end of the, uh, the batten into the, uh, the rubber again there, move up forward, pull it around, and the gap has considerably decreased. In fact, it's gone back to about three millimetres, which indicates that it needs a little more sanding. Now, by close observation, I see that the, that the angle to which I've sanded this particular former is perfectly okay. That one needs a little bit more angle, so by the time I take the angle off that and chamfer it so that it conforms to the shape of the boat, the batten will pretty well be in contact right there. Okay, now I reckon that should be pretty close, so we'll just apply the batten once again by stretching the bungee cords around. By the way, when you're doing this, make sure that the, the cord is right against the transom rather than being out like that because it's likely to slide off and it'll also give you an inaccurate reading. We'll stretch it around again and I find that it contacts one, two, three and of course the end former. So we have those formers nice and fair, at least at that point. So I'll just move it down a little. You'll see how easy it is to control. Again, it's fair all the way around. I'll move it back up again to this, uh, this part here, over the, the, the turn of the bilge, hold it fairly firmly. And again, we have it nice and fair. Now as you can see I'm having a little bit of trouble holding the batten on that particular curve because of the angle of the rubber so we can overcome that problem very very smartly by simply driving a little brad in there and that will prevent that from moving right, we're there. Now again bringing it back over all of each of those formers I find that it's contacting all of them up to here quite happily. Now that gives me what I need as far as the fair uh, sections on one, two, three, four, and of course the transom there. So I, I'm, I know at this particular stage, and obviously there are, there are checks later on, as you go through it you check and double check everything you do, but I'm, I'm reasonably content that that section of the boat is fair enough at this particular stage of the endeavour. Now, the, the situation changes a little as we move up forward here. So we'll just change the angle of the camera so you can see it more clearly and I'll show you what happens here. Okay, now you can see the problem that I'm having here quite clearly. And it's one that I mentioned a, a little further down the boat. You notice that because the former is cut square, the batten is only contacting one edge of it and that applies to the three bow formers there. Now that means that what I'm going to have to do is chamfer this off fairly uh, extremely so that the batten will contact the former all the way across and by bending that batten down and having a close look I can see that once I've done that it's going to contact the three formers 
and the bow. Now I'll go ahead and do that and we'll come back when it's finished. Now this particular former, as you'll notice, has a double curvature because I've introduced a little bit of flare into the bow of the boat here. The planer is fine to take the, to rough it off, but obviously it's not going to go around that curve and that's where this machine really comes into play. And I'll show you how. Because it has, it goes over rollers, you've got a choice of a flat area there to sand flat and you also have the ability to sand around quite a uh, a tight inside curve by using the front of the roller in this way. Now you'll notice that I moved the, the machine in that way so that I'm using the curve of that roller to get down into that little curve there and it works absolutely perfectly. The same applies up the top. In fact, it's an even tighter curve and even more suitable for using the roller on the, on the sander. OK, now's the time to put the batten back on and have another look at how it's going. Now, I need to take a little more of an angle there and I need to take a bit more material off this particular former because it's touching these two but that one's holding it away from from this one so you can you can see that you work progressively down the boat now it's a lot bigger problem to leave material on in other words to have a lump there than it is to take too much material off and have a hollow because you can always drive a little wedge and I'll show you the t technique later you can always drive a little wedge in there to accommodate a low spot on the former. So you do have flexibility. I mean, uh, on the one hand, it, it, you must work as accurately and as thoroughly as you possibly can. On the other hand, if you do have a problem, it's not really a disaster. And the, the, the mark of a true tradesman, or a true artisan if you like, is one who can accommodate whatever circumstance happens to arise in, in, the, in the conduct of a job. And somebody who is able to do that is somebody who can who never really has to go back to the beginning and start again and I'd certainly hate to have to to do that so we'll I'll finish these off I'll get them as fair as I possibly can and then we'll come back and put the battens on Okay, now as you can see, using the bat, and I found that this one was also a little high. So not only do you work from one into the other, but you also work backwards in the opposite direction so that you can make sure that everything's fine. Now I had some trouble with this one. It also was too high, but putting the batten on, as you can see, it, the batten touches all of them all the way along in each position. So I'm, I'm quite content now that the fairing is complete, it's really worked out well. Now the next thing to do is to put the first uh, batten onto the, uh, the jig, the first actual fixed batten onto the jig, and that's the one that follows the gunnel or the shear line. Now I'll get that in, show you how all that works, and then we'll proceed to install 
all of these on this particular side. And one of the problems you strike because of the fact that, the, that a boat has a centre line and it's essential that it, it be as exactly symmetrical as possible on either side of the centre line, because of pencil line thicknesses, because of variations in measurement from side to side, you'll find that critical areas sometimes creep out of alignment. So what I have to do here now is put the shear batten in in these notches. Now obviously that has to exactly correspond with the shear batten on the other side. So what I've done is use my spirit level again to translate the levels, etc., from that side to this side. Before I did that, by the way, I checked it for level once again, just as a double check, and I've cut these notches out. Now, I originally cut them out, if you remember when we first cut the formers, I originally cut those notches out. I found that I've had to elongate a couple of them to make the shear line exactly correspond to the other side. But that really isn't any problem. Another, another thing that I've had to do also is make a couple of them deeper, but I'll show you how we fix that in just a moment. Now, what we, we have to do is install that batten in those notches like that all the way along the length of the boat and fix them in nice and solidly. So the way to do that is to, to squeeze a, uh, a, a dab of PVA glue. PVA, by the way, is marvellous glue when you're working particularly with chipboard because it's the the glue which is used to, to stick the chipboard together. So my, so my trusty container of PVA glue, uh, whilst it may be a fairly basic sort of an adhesive, is certainly the thing to use on a job like this. Now I found when I was fitting again the battens on the other side that if I drove the screws into the batten without first drilling a hole, it would simply split the batten. So what we have to do is drill a clearance hole in the batten there install the, the screw on the end of the power screwdriver, line that up on the centre and I have the screwdriver set on the lowest possible speed. And just drive that home. Now it needs a little more than that, so I'll just crank the speed up a little more and drive that screw in so that it, it countersinks. Perfect. Come along to this one. Now if I push that in, you'll notice that it's, it's substantially below that line there. Now that is unacceptable, so what we have to do is pack it out. Now I'll show you how we do that. First of all we squeeze some glue in here, get the, the hole drilled in the batten so that we know that it's going to line up. I mentioned before that if you have a low spot you can wedge it out. Now I've simply cut a piece of this batten on the bandsaw to make little tiny wedges. Squeeze some glue onto both sides of that and, and this is where you really get your fingers sticky but no problems, it's, uh, it's soluble in water so it comes off very easily. Put that in there, offer the batten up and just push the, the wedge up until the batten lines up with the surface. It's right there now, no problems at all. Put the screw in. Now I know that the screw is going to split the wedge but the wedge will be captured in there anyhow. And there it is, packed out to exactly the right level. OK, now I'll go along and do all the other ones back as soon as that's finished. OK, well that's the last screw put in the, the shear batten, which starts the process of putting the battens right over the top of the boat. Now, this is one of those areas in which a well-equipped workshop really comes into play. I, I discovered when I was putting the battens on the other side earlier today that the size that in which they came, which was 7 16 or about 12 millimetres thick, was too thick to easily go over and conform to the curves. I cracked a couple of battens uh, as they moved over the, uh, the formers there. So I've decided to thin them down. Now, I mentioned right at the very beginning that I had a planar thicknesser here on my little mobile work trolley and this is where it really comes into play. It's a superb piece of equipment and with absolutely no effort at all it'll reduce those from their 7 16 of an inch thickness right back to the thickness that I require. Now I'll run them through, show you what's happening on the way through and show you a couple of details of the operation of the machine.
before we go to the final cut, I'll just tell you a little bit about this piece of equipment. It will take timber from 10 inches, up to 10 inches wide by 5 inches deep. As you can see, you can adjust the thickness simply by winding that handle up and down. And what I've done to make life easier is put a, there's a scale on the side here, but I put a little bit of masking tape over it and I've put a pencil mark exactly where the final thickness is. Now it's taken three cuts, the last one of which we're about to make, to get these down to the thickness that I require. The pointer is now on that mark and we're ready to go through for the final cut. Okay, now, obviously, the sequences and methods that I've used for doing this have been governed to a certain extent by the fact that we're making this videotape. Now, under normal circumstances, the last thing I would ever do is put all of the battens on one side of a jig and none on the other. But obviously, so that we could show the sequence in as, as easy a way as possible, it was necessary for me to do that. If I were building the thing again and not making a videotape, what I would do would be to put a batten on that side and then put the corresponding batten on this side. Now they bend very easily, but they do exert a certain amount of pressure. Obviously they're trying to return to straight again. And you get a dozen of them together and the amount of pressure that they exert is really quite substantial. And there's every chance that they could distort the jig by trying to pull it straight on one side. Now the bracing that I've put in here leads me to be pretty sure that the jig isn't distorted. So what I'm saying is that when you're installing the battens, in other words doing the operation that we're about to do now, you, you put a batten on one side, you immediately turn around and put the corresponding batten on the other side and work backwards and forwards from side to side as you go. That's most important. Now let's get busy and we'll actually install these battens. Now if you look at these formers, you'll notice, particularly by measurement, that one has a, a, a semi-girth to the shear strake of, th of three feet. This one here has a half girth to the shear strake of 26 inches. Now there's a 10 inch difference in the measurement from there to there on that one and the same measurement on this one. This one up here is around about, if I can get the tape to hold still, 30 inches. So obviously if we, have to, if we want to put the battens on equally we have to find some formula to use so that each batten corresponds to about the same position on each of those formers. That's logical. Now you could run them parallel with the keel but you would find that you'd, you'd have half battens and short battens as you got down here uh, and that would create difficulties. You could run them parallel with the strake but the same thing would happen up here because you'd have a batten coming through parallel and finishing there and leaving a wide gap here, quite obviously. So logically the easiest way to do it is to take half of the measurement along say three of your stations and put your batten onto that. Now that's 36 inches so if I mark off 18 inches there I know that I'm halfway come down to this one. This one from memory was 26 inches so I mark off 13 inches there and this one up here I think was 30 inches from memory and it was so I mark off 15 inches there. Now you don't have to be dead accurate but as accurate as you like. Now for convenience you'll notice I've got quite a wide keel strake on there for, for convenience, I didn't measure from the centre of it, I hooked it over the side of that keel strake. The variation in measurement that that represents really doesn't matter at all. Now from here on in, it's simply a matter of offering up a batten to the, to the, uh, the jig, making sure that there's plenty of overhang on either end. A word about overhang by the way, whatever you do, don't put the end of your batten right on the end of the transom because the first thing that will happen is the screw will split it again as I found. It splits very easily this, uh, this Mirandi. So make sure there's plenty of overhang on both ends and I'm confident that I can get 
both ends in quite comfortably there with a decent overhang. Our relief hole at that point there, making sure we don't go into the chipboard and insert the screw. And you'll notice how beautifully the power screwdriver countersunk that screw. Most important, by the way, that that be countersunk. Bring it all up to this end. Another relief hole. Remembering to angle the hole according to the angle of the bulkhead so that you get the maximum purchase for the screw. Uh, as I've said quite a few times, this material doesn't hold very well. So you need, you need the maximum possible uh, a screw purchase into the chipboard. You don't want it coming out one side of the board. Now we'll move up to this point here. Again, a relief hole. A screw. Fix it in. Now at this point, again, your eye comes into it. Get down and have a sight along it, see if there are any nasty kinks in it, if it's, uh, if it's obviously out of place somewhere. It all looks quite good to me. It could probably move up a tiny bit there. You'll find that even though the battens may be a little bit distorted, that they'll pretty well sit in the right position. Now right up the bow here, I know that I've put that corresponding batten on, so I'll line up, line this one up with that one, make sure it's, uh, it's perfectly okay picked up the, the wrong machine. Now this hole I drill very close to the bow at an angle that allows the screw to go well and truly into that bow former there, the stem former. Put the screw in. And that one's fixed down its length. Now there's, there's no point at this stage in going along and putting all the other screws in. I'll show you how we place the other battens. Just grab my tape measure there. Now once again, all we have to do is go half and half. Now I can see that I've got uh, 18 inches there, so I'll go 9 inches at this point. We have 15 inches there, so 7.5 inches at this point. And right down the transom, we have 13 inches, so it becomes 6.5 inches. Now, because I'm measuring from just past the centre line, if I put the battens uh, on the, the top edge of the batten on that line, it'll get it a bit closer to half the distance. Again, that aspect of it really isn't critical. So we'll just grab another batten, make sure we've got some overhang on both ends, no problems. Locate our relief hole. And again, using the power screwdriver, screw the batten on. This, um, actually this is probably my favourite part of the whole job because it's where you really see the shape of the boat growing before your eyes. Again, just line the batten up with that mark there, put a hole in, screw it down. These screws, by the way, are very, very good for this material. They're, they have a, an extremely coarse thread. They're designed specifically for very soft materials such as chipboard. Do the same thing down aft. Now obviously because we're going halfway on all the battens, each of the battens is slightly curved. That also helps to keep everything in line and nice and rigid. That one's fixed home. Again, up forward pick up the corresponding batten on the other side and you can, it's surprising in spite of the fact that all the battens are there, you can really see which one is which. Put the, the screw in and that fixes the second of the battens. Now this process is repeated obviously until you have all of the battens fixed home. Again, looking along that, it's got a nice gentle curve all the way around. There aren't any lumps or kinks in it, so I'm quite content that it's laying nice and true and fair. Again, using the pencil and the rule, measure 
halfway down, halfway between these two, which will be 18 inches again, obviously. Nine inches down from the top. Same right along. Now, once I've gotten that one fixed, I have one, two, three fixed down each side. Now, if I put one in between, the spacing between them is a little too far apart. The battens have to be reasonably close together so that you've got plenty of points upon which to pull the foam down. So rather than putting uh, one in between each of them, I'll then put two in between each of them. So I end up with a, a total of a dozen battens uh, from the, the, the keel down to the shear. Now I'll get all that done and we'll be right back. Okay, well, again, another couple of hours and a couple of days have gone by and we've applied all of the stringers to the jig. She's just about ready for the final finishing. And it's at this stage where, if you stand back and have a look at it, you can really see the lines of the little boat. And I must admit, I'm very pleased with them. She, she really does look like a nice little boat. She's quite flat down here, which means she'll be stable. She's got nice gentle lines, nice and full in the bow, so she won't bury her bow in a sea. She should be very dry. She's very deep up here. The shear line sweeps all the way up. And she should really be an excellent little boat. In fact, she'll be ideal for sailing. And we intend, once we've built the, the foam boat, to fit her with a little mast and sail and just see how she comes up. It, it could well be that with this uh, tape on building the jig and then on building the boat, that we'll find some people, maybe even in the schools, who'll be interested in building Kitten and who then could perhaps even turn her, in, turn her into a, uh, a school sailing class or something like that. But that's in the future and we'll see what happens. Now, the only area that is left to work on is this strake here. Now, I've put a second one in underneath and you will have probably wondered as we've gone through the jig building sequence why I had two notches while I've checked two strakes in. Well, there's an excellent reason for that which I'll tell you about just before we finish. But this one here is actually the shear line. It's ready to be finished off. Now if you'll just have a look at this bow area, you'll see that I've stopped the shear strake there and I've cut a piece of uh, chipboard with a slight curve in it to conform to that little flare at the top of the bow. Now, the reason I use chipboard there is because it's not possible to get the stringer to conform to that curve. So I've had to actually shape it by cutting that piece out on the bandsaw. Now, all that remains at this area is to uh, fare that in with the belt sander, which I'll proceed to do. Okay, now one of the problems that we had was that because the timber that we use for the stringers is fairly dry, after I'd installed this one here, the, the, the strake stringer, it cracked. And instead of being a gentle curve over to there, it's cracked here and gone in a straight line down to that station there. Now, that's not necessarily a problem because, as you will have noticed, this one is actually checked in to the former all the way along. So in order to get it out to level, I have to put another one over the top. Now the reason I checked it in and glued it in was to make it nice and strong because there'll be a fair bit of, of uh, pressure exerted on that as we actually build the boat. So I wanted to make that one particularly nice and strong. So that means that I've got to make up another stringer uh, to thickness and put it over the top of this. Now because that's cracked there and it goes straight, if I put the, the top one over the top and just clamp it to this here with some glue on it, it will overcome the fact that I've lost the curve between those two stations. Now, it really isn't that much of a problem. It's a sort of minor problem that you'll strike as you go through the building process. But I find that I can overcome that little problem simply by doing a little bit of thinking, a, a bit of planning ahead, and use the, the materials that I have at hand to avoid the necessity of having to pull that out and replace it, which, as I said, would be a difficult job because it's been screwed in as well as glued. So I'll just prepare this stringer up here, which we do very simply by putting some glue on it. Again, because this, uh, 
uh, this jig will spend its, uh, its time indoors and won't be subject to moisture. Uh, I can use PVA glue which is perfectly adequate for the, for the purpose. Just run a, a thin bead of PVA all the way along it there. Requires a fair bit of pressure by the way to squeeze the bottle. Now I judge that that's a bit over length but I judge that I'll have plenty on there to cover the length I have to cover. And grab my trusty box full of assorted G-clamps. By the way, it doesn't matter what you're doing in a workshop, G-clamps are amazingly valuable pieces of equipment. Now it's a fairly simple procedure to put that on there, put a spring clamp on it just to hold it in place while you get a G-clamp out, and I'll get one that's, that's readily adjusted so that we can do it more quickly. Put the G-clamp on and just make sure the two, the two um, pieces of timber are lined up do the clamp up and repeat that procedure all the way along. Now, as you can see at this stage, we're in a position where that secondary uh, chine or uh, I'm sorry, straight stringer has brought the overall level out so that it's exactly right to conform with the rest of the jig. Now, there's a couple of other little tricks that we have to uh, that we have to play here as well, and I'll tell you about those in just a moment. So. Uh, I'll just continue doing this and we'll come back as soon as I've finished it. Okay, now we've, we've clamped that on. We've made sure that the glue is squeezed out through the, along the length of the timber so we know it's in contact pretty well all the way along. And it's now time to leave that for probably three or four hours until the PVA glue dries, which it does fairly quickly. But it's being asked to hold uh, quite a, a, a fair amount of uh, force down here, so we have to make sure that it's absolutely dry. Now the only uh, other thing that's left to do is to install one more strake, and I'll just turn the jig around there, and you'll see that on top of that shear strake there, I've put another stringer <coughs> just above it and down flush with it. Now what's going to happen, the reason for that is, when we're actually building the boat, we're going to screw from the inside the actual shear strake for the boat itself, which is the same thickness as the, uh, as the foam, on this one here. And when the foam comes down, we want to support it right uh, adjacent to that actual shear strake. So this one here is to stop the foam from moving in and give us something against which to rest it when we're actually putting the foam on the boat. Now I mentioned before that I'd tell you what this second uh, stringer was for. When you put the foam on here, obviously it has quite a, a, a decent curve to conform to. And what I'm going to do is use a special method uh, uh, using a, a, a ratchet type strap to pull the foam down onto the contour and that strake underneath is actually the bar to which I will hook that strap when I pull it down. But that's a little trick that you'll have to find out when you watch building the actual boat itself. We're very fortunate in building a boat of this size that it's very easy to fare these stations up well. Now, in a larger boat such as the jig we looked at at the beginning of this tape, it's, it's much easier for things to get a little bit out of line. If they do, you'll often find that you have a low spot on one of these, these uh, formers or even just on one stringer on one former. It's very easy to overcome any problems that that uh, brings about by simply doing what we did with the legs and driving a little wedge in it. Ease the screw off, drive the wedge in, sight along the stringer until it comes up to fair and you've solved the problem. And you can see right here the way in which the builder of this large jig has overcome the problems of having one of his formers uh, quite a deal low, in fact nearly half an inch low, over a span of about 10 of his stringers and you can see how he's overcome the problem and brought the stringers back into fair. Okay, there really is only one thing left to do and that is to continue the process that I spoke about right at the very beginning and that is to make sure that everything is absolutely as fair as you can get it all the way through the building process. Now don't forget the foam is fairly rigid and it's capable of bridging uh, hollows and, and, uh, and even hills in the jig. So there is a, a, effectively a self-leveling process that goes on when you're attaching the foam. But if you rely on that and don't worry about this part 
being properly fair, you'll find that you'll have a hungry horse, you'll have hills and hollows all over the boat. So once again I emphasise the fact that you must take absolutely every effort to make sure that every step is aimed towards total fairness of the jig. That way, when you finish the boat and, and put a high gloss uh, a polyurethane paint surface on the outside of the boat, you'll be able to stand back and be really proud that there are no hills and hollows and bumps and unsightly blemishes in the surface. It'll be absolutely as fair as one that has come out of a mould and has been professionally produced. The, the sander is used simply to go over the, the strakes, uh, round out uh, a curve onto the surface of the strakes, uh, knock the, the heads off any screws that may be left slightly proud of the surface by not having been countersunk properly. I was a bit reluctant actually to drive these screws too hard into this timber because they're actually screwing into chipboard which doesn't really have much holding power. If I were screwing into timber I'd have been going to really countersink the screws and take them right in. In fact it, it's a tribute to the design of the screws that some of them have gone in a quarter of an inch and really countersunk themselves very well. So there are some screw heads that are a little proud. Uh, one of the, the uh, stringers has cracked here as this one did down the bottom. So I can sand that off and sand that back fair again. By the way, another little tip. If you find that the design that you're building has curves that the stringers won't accommodate, there are two ways of overcoming it, Bo both of them involving soaking with water. One is to simply soak, uh, say, that much of the stringer w in water for a couple of hours before you put it on. You'll find that that'll make it quite pliable. If the, the curve cannot still be accommodated by the stringer which has been soaked with water, you use the old uh, timber boat builder's trick of making up a steaming box which is generally a length of, uh, uh, of metal water pipe with the end plugged up and a blow lamp under the end and some water in it. Wrap the top with towel, put your, uh, put your timber in and then wrap the top with towel to, uh, to seal it off and boil it for three or four hours. Now that drives superheated water right through the fibres of the timber and you can almost tie knots in it. It's quite astonishing how pliable uh, it, it makes it. So, if you do have a, a, a shape in the jig which requires that sort of, uh, of measure in order to make the stringers go down, it's quite easy to use that and to adopt it. Now I'll just show you some of the sanding techniques. One of the main things with a sander like this is never leave it still because the minute you do it starts to dig itself in. So you must move it all the time. And the patterns to which you move it are governed by the shapes that you're sanding. So. It's just a matter of a backwards and forwards motion there. Make sure that it's not stopped at any given time. And it's surprising how rapidly you'll round off the edges of the straights. You'll notice that they're shattering there underneath the, the sander. You round off the edges of the straights. Occasionally you might even see a, uh, a little bit of a spark as the, uh, the sander takes the head off one of those screws which is proud. Now it's taken that one back beautifully. It really has. It's taken it right back flush. These sanders are marvellous pieces of equipment. Now in this area here, I'll just stop the sander so I can talk to you. This strake has come down and it hasn't really twisted to conform to the shape of the bow. So I've got some little steps as I go down this area of the bow. Obviously, that's a place that the sander can really work well for it. Now, there's another problem. You've got to make sure that you've got plenty of spare sanding bolts available because they'll pick up on a little tight edge there and it'll tear them. But you can see the way that smoothing process, that fairing process, has started. It'll probably take me three quarters of an hour working very carefully with a medium grit sanding belt to be satisfied that this jig is as fair as I could get it. I've obviously, I'll sand all the way down the front there uh, and get the, the ends of the stringers uh, all fared off. And at that stage, the jig is ready to build the boat. Now, I would estimate, we haven't made this tape up yet, but I'd estimate that it's taken almost two hours to tell this story. And in a lot of cases, the people who produce videos and produce this type of thing are very conscious of time. They want to get it into a half an hour, tell the thing as quickly as possible for reasons other than being thorough with the job that they're doing. 
Now that's not our philosophy. We will take absolutely as long as it takes to, to tell every detail of the story, even running the risk probably of repeating ourselves a few times. But uh, it's, it's my belief that you should be absolutely sure of every single thing you do as you go through the construction of your boat. I believe that video is one of the most amazing mediums available to modern day men in order to convey knowledge. In fact, using video, I can get what's in my head and in my hands into your head and your hands. And you can do the job absolutely as well as I can or anybody else who's been doing it for years and who is completely experienced, providing video is used as, the, as a medium as effectively as possible to do that. So I'm quite excited about the fact that we've embarked on this series of tapes on a whole lot of fiberglass techniques. Obviously, the next tape will involve building this foam sandwich boat, but we also have plans for a lot of other tapes uh, on various fiberglass techniques, uh, building plugs, building moulds. We'll probably take a mould off this first kitten that we built and show you actually how to make the fiberglass mould, how you go through the various procedures to make sure the surface is right, how you reinforce it, how you split it down the centre so that you can accommodate undercuts and things like that. We'll be looking at uh, foam sandwich uh, materials that are laid into moulds and used in that particular way. Some of the more exotic materials that are readily available on today's market. In fact, true space age materials, materials that were developed for uh, space vehicles are now available on an over-the-counter basis. So it's an exciting subject and video is a truly exciting medium with which to convey it. I look forward to seeing you back in our next Adfi Tech tape, which will be Advanced Fiberglass Techniques Tape 3, building a foam sandwich boat. Let's go back to the jig. So there it is, the jig for Kitten is at the same stage as this jig was before the hull was built off it. And this is where the story really starts. This is where I guess the adventure begins because you're not just building something that you're going to use and then throw away. From here on, you're actually building the boat that you're going to sail away in. Now, as you can see, this is a huge and imposing jig and certainly dwarfs uh, the kitten in almost every way. But having seen us build the jig and looking at this again now, you can see the way in which the two relate. Now, I mentioned towards the end of the tape there that we actually put our stringers on at half the depth of the frames. Now, uh, the, the gentleman who built this didn't do that. He put his stringers on essentially parallel with the shear of the boat. And as you can see up over the the, the keel there, the, the string has simply come along and stopped. Now, it was more difficult for us to do that because the boat was smaller and because the shape was more complex. But either way works because as I've said several times through this tape, all you're trying to achieve is a rigid form over which to fix your, your foam to build your boat. So you don't have to turn this into a, a, a great example of craftsmanship. All it has to be is true to shape, is fair and is solid enough to be able to put the foam on and build the boat. Now in the next tape we're going to get busy and build the boat. I hope you'll join us uh, in the building of Kitten. Uh, we'll take her all the way through the, from the very beginnings all the way through to putting her on the water. So I look forward to seeing you in Adfi Tech number two which is building a foam sandwich boat.